Shabbat Shalom. Hebrews quotes a passage in Habakkuk that talks about everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And after we've had several days of this wind, I start wondering what else can be shaken. Oh, it's, uh, whenever you see the power of nature, it kind of reminds you that there are forces so much more vast and greater than we can drum up on our own. I, I look at that picture of the, the bridge across a river just north of Yellowstone. It's about 20 miles north. There's a, but I don't know, I think it's about a 50 foot bridge, steel girders, and the flood just picked it up. I mean, you looked at that and you're, you know, to, to me it's immovable, can't be shaken. It just reminds us that in life there are things that can't be shaken, but almost none of them are physical. Physical things don't endure as big and powerful as they are. They just don't. I'd like you to go to Genesis 12. We're going to read the first nine verses. This is a, you know, there are several passages in Scripture that are foundational to who we are and our belief. This is one of the most important passages in Scripture. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house. And if you remember in chapter 11, Abram and his brother and his father had moved from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran or Haran there in the Mesopotamia. And so that's where they are. And Terah dies there. So he says, I want you to go forth from here, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as Yahweh had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And you recall Lot is Nahor's son. He is Abram's nephew. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He took Sarah his wife and Lot his nephew and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem which is really quite far south in Israel. If you look at a map and, and the way they say Shechem in Hebrew, it almost comes out as one syllable, Shem. Almost sounds like Shem. They hardly say the, and it, well, I always grew up saying Shechem, but the, well, if you go to Israel, they'll say the name of the town and you won't know what they're talking about. To the Oak of Moray. Now, the Canaanite was then in the land. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to Yahweh who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to Yahweh and called upon the name of Yahweh. Abram journeyed on, journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. And I think you all know the Negev is the desert in the south, very south of Israel. It even extends south of the Dead Sea. Genesis in some ways, it may be the most important book in the Bible because you know, people have all kinds of questions about why this, why that, the little video we just watched describing the Trinity. And for a lot of people, they just don't want to be bothered with things that are that complex. And yet, there's always this deep curiosity. How did things happen? Where did they come from? Why are things the way they are? And one of the big things that plagues human beings is why is there so much pain in the world? Why is there so much injustice? Why is there so much sickness? 
Well, if you actually read the first part of the book of Genesis, it explains it. Uh, and it starts off with God creating the world and the universe, and it's good. He says over and over, he, he created it and it was good. But after the six days of creation and he rested on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, then we start the account of man, Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve fall. And so into this perfect creation, sin is introduced, which is a rebellion against God. Out of this rebellion comes pain, work, to eat. You know, the way it starts off in Eden, the trees are there, they produce fruit. It's for the people that live there. And at least to our human minds, it sounds a lot easier than what comes out of that. And so, based on the book of Genesis, the world descends into this rebellion against God. It gets so bad that during the life of Noah, God says, I, I can't deal with this. The violence and the lawlessness in the world, I'm going to destroy all mankind with a flood, and I'll save Noah and his children. So he does that. We start again, and it really doesn't seem to take long before people are in this rebellion again. We just went through the story of the Tower of Babel, or Babel where the people are going to build a tower and ascend to heaven, but the Bible goes out of its way to say that they're going to use bricks for stone and tar for mortar. They're going to do it according to their way. They're not going to follow God's ways. And so into all this chaos, all this brokenness that the Bible recounts, now comes along a man named Abram, and God says, I want you to leave. Already he moved him from Ur of the Chaldees, Babylon later became, to the Mesopotamia, up by Haran, Haran really. And now God says, I want you to go to the land I show you. And so that starts here, but it makes this claim. It says, I'm going to make you a great nation, a multitude of nations. Those who bless you, I'll bless. Those who curse you, I'll curse. And then he makes the statement that in you, all the families of the world will be blessed. So we've had this story of in Adam and Eve, really, all the world was cursed, really, through the fall. The story of Abram that progresses to the story of Israel is the story of the Bible. We'll talk a little bit about the fact that for some reason, Christians at times lose this story. And it's a little bit, you know, we, we've struggled talking about the community and how to form the community and, and, and how to do various projects. One of the things you will always encounter is that human beings want the benefits of a situation without the investment. That's that human nature again. But Abram has two sons, the son Isaac has chosen for this line that in this family all the world will be blessed. And Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob is the one that is chosen. In both cases, it's the younger second son. And if we fast forward, so to speak, we know that the way that Abram's family blesses the whole world is that through this family comes the Messiah. And this is another theme that crops up all through the prophets. Is that there will be, sometimes it says there will be David, other times it says a son of David. And it, it's all through scripture. I think you all know Isaiah 9. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And of the increase of this government, there'll be no end. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor. Everlasting Father, Almighty God, the Prince of Peace. Th this is a consistent theme. Isaiah 11 says, there'll be a shoot spring up from the stem of Jesse. And then it talks about the seven spirits of God. The Spirit of God, or Spirit of the Lord, Yahweh, wisdom and understanding, 
got to think here. Counsel and power. Counsel as in giving counsel and power or might. And then knowledge and the fear of the Lord. But out of this will come this ruler who rules with righteousness. He's not moved by ambition, by power, by money. And, and this is the whole hope of Israel. You know, Greg mentioned the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were looking for the Messiah, but they weren't looking for a Messiah to save them from their sin. They were looking for a Messiah to save them from Rome. And that's very understandable because it was hard to live with Rome. But the way God, God knows what he's doing. You see this so many places. Uh, Ezekiel 34 mentions David will be the ruler. Ezekiel 37 that talks about the two sticks coming together. It says, after these two sticks are one in my hand, there will be one ruler. No longer will there be two nations. One ruler. So this, this hope. And y'all remember the story that Nebuchadnezzar had. The dream. And the, the second chapter of Daniel is, it's almost humorous because I'm not, my life's not in danger, but... The king wakes up in the morning, he's had a dream, he assembles his wise men and he says, I had a dream. They said, fine king, what was the dream? We'll interpret it for you. He says, I don't remember. You tell me the dream. And then you interpret it. Well, king, no one can do that. You'd better or you're going to die. And he moved on, he was going to kill all the wise men and someone let Daniel know and Daniel said, well, I, I don't know, but I know someone who does know. He says, tell the king to just wait. And Daniel and his three friends fast, pray, ask the Lord, and the Lord gives him the dream. And this dream, if you remember, is this statue that has a gold head and I think a silver chest and then iron and uh, goes down to legs of, no, the legs are of iron and the feet are mixed iron and clay. And of course, it's a picture of four kingdoms. But the important story, part of the dream that there's a little stone broken out of the mountain and as it comes down to the mountain it gets larger and larger till it fills the whole earth and destroys the statue grinds it to powder obviously a messianic prophecy that this promise to Abraham will come to fulfillment in someone who will inaugurate the kingdom of God here on earth and all the kings of man will disappear before this king it, it's constant all through the prophets. Another one, Daniel 7. I kept looking in the night, visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So this son of man comes before, who's the ancient of days? This is Yahweh, this is the Father. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. All this is anticipated in the promise to Abraham. Everything to do with Yeshua and his time on earth, the redemption that he brought, it all has to do with the promise to Abraham. Abram, who became Abraham. When you lose this, you miss you mess up the story. It's like learning the top and not knowing the foundation. Genesis 12 is where we are, but if you go to Revelation 12, John says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. John is seeing in Revelation what Daniel sees, that the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days and to the Son of Man is given all dominion, all the power, all authority. So it says, the kingdom of God, the salvation and power and the authority of his Messiah have come, the accuser of our brethren is thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. The 
people of Abraham are, that is the story of the Bible. Je Revelation 21, I think everyone here knows what Revelation talks, 21 talks about. John is in this vision and he sees a city come down from the heavenly places. This city is the bride of the Son of Man, the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. This bride is built on a foundation of the twelve apostles and the gates into the bride are the twelve tribes. This is the story of the Bible. I'm emphasizing this because if you lose this, you'll lose some, a few things we'll talk about here, but to try to divorce Christianity from Abraham is unbiblical and it creates cognitive dissonance. And one of my favorite things that I saw this week was someone who wrote cognitive dissidents. And I went, dissidents? Cognitive dis? Oh, it, it made sense. But uh, the kingdom we look for is a kingdom ruled over by a son of David who is the seed of Abraham, Genesis 12. Now, Paul, our uh, Brit, Chadashah, that the New Testament reference for this week is Galatians 3. Galatians 3 makes this statement. If you belong to the Messiah, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. This is a very important piece of our faith. How many of you know that we struggle with the idea that we're sons and and daughters of Abraham, but we're Gentiles. Does this make sense? It's something to wrestle with. How do we become children of Abraham? If you belong to the Messiah, then you are Abraham's descendants. If I were to ask you, what is Abraham called? What, what is he known as among both Jews and Christians? He is the what? Come on. I heard somebody say it. He's the father of the faith, right? He, he, how many places do we say Abraham our father? He is our father. In fact, anybody that knows Hebrew, Avram. What is Av? It's dad. It's father. You know, in the New Testament where it says, by the Holy Spirit, we know we are adopted and we say what? Abba. Avinu. It's our father. Abraham is the father. What do we do to become children of Abraham? And here's the whole wrestling match that's in the New Testament is that many of the Jews thought you needed to become a Jew to become a son of Abraham. I thought about this quite a bit because it was, it's understandable to me why the Jews thought that since the Christians were becoming children of Abraham, they would need to become Jews. And I'll read you some, uh, some passages that will make you wonder. But Galatians 3 is all about Paul saying, some of you have been caught up in the law, the letter of the law, and you've missed the spirit. And so I got thinking about what makes people focus on minutia and miss the big picture? What, what happens? And I can tell you one of the things is to be fatherless. When you look at the promises of Scripture, one of the most important promises is you will not be orphans. 
If you look around you in the world today, have you noticed that people are living as orphans? They don't see. See, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, did they see God as their father? Or did they see God as Pharaoh? <coughs> Most of the culture today sees God as Pharaoh. When we see God as Pharaoh, we're going to emphasize the letter of the law. We're going to miss the spirit. We're going to miss why is this, what's the purpose of this command? I'm going to read Genesis 17, just a few verses. Now when Abram, Abram, and of course in Hebrew this is really Avram. I don't know why we say B when it's V. Uh, it's never been B. Why we have Abram, it's always been Avram. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. In Genesis 28, where Jacob is blessing Joseph's sons, listen to how he starts his blessing. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil, this is Jacob speaking, Bless the lads, this is his two grandsons, and may my name live on in them, and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. One of the things that you notice in the way we set up families is that the name of the father lives on in the family. What does the priest do every week? And the sons of Aaron will do what? Put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. There's something about Abraham, Abraham, he is our father and the blessing of Abraham is to be attached to us. And what is that blessing? Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse, I will curse. Greg mentioned a, a scripture that's quite famous that we talk about. I bet everyone here knows, if the sun sets you free, what? You'll be free indeed. How many of you know that that follows immediately this statement? They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you are Abraham's children, what? Do you know what it says? Do the deeds of Abraham. Paul talks about the commandment, honor your father and mother as the first commandment with promise. One of the things that I've noticed as I mentioned in our society is that there's been a breakdown in the family. It's been going on for a long time and for whatever reason, there was actually a New York Times article published in the last few months that said fathers have become unnecessary. We don't need fathers. Kind of like a bull stud, you know, make kids and get out of the way. But the problem, what we've noticed, is that children without fathers have some developmental problems. And you know, we, when we see these mass murders, you'll get all this fighting over it. it's, it's guns, it's not guns, it's breakdown of the family. It, the truth is, it's probably all of these things. You can't put your thumb on a single cause, but how many of you would agree with me that when I have inside of me this anger, this chaos boiling up, and I expend that by killing other people, and often myself, Would you describe that as a slave or as free? I, I think it's pretty obvious. 
Where does your sense of well-being come from? Where does your sense of stability come from? Many countries that do not have the same problems with violence that we do still have the same problems that we have with broken families. And yet, a study that was done in clear back in 97, I don't know about you, but it, it bothered me to realize that 20, 97 was 25 years ago. But the most reliable indicator of violent crime in a community is the proportion of fatherless families. According to a 93 Metropolitan Life Survey, violence in public schools, 71% of teachers and 90% of law enforcement officials state that the lack of parental supervision at home is a major factor that contributes to the violence in schools. And fatherlessness decreases the amount and quality of this supervision dramatically. I'm just bringing out the fact that there's something about fathers that is incredibly important to the setting apart of Abraham. He is our father. And somehow his influence was continued to his son Isaac and then Jacob and is to be continued on down to where each of us who are fathers have the call to be Abraham. We have the call to do the deeds of Abraham to provide father in the home, father in society. And I'd be the last one to say that the breakdown of the family is all the problem we have in our society. But Yeshua said this in Matthew 24, which I think does give us a clue. He says, in those days, because lawlessness has increased, most, people, most people's love will grow cold. But he, the one who endures to the end, will be saved. What do you think it means that when lawlessness increases, that people's love grows cold. Let me ask you a question. When you're driving down the road and you see somebody broken down off the side of the road, what's your response? Lois says it depends on who's in the car with her. Is there anybody else? How many of you stop? How many of you stop and think, this doesn't look safe? Why? Why are you afraid? Because of the increase of lawlessness. Between here and Delta, you know when somebody's broken down, that's almost a life and death thing. Those of us, remember years ago, we were coming out with the Supreme Council, Doug remembers, there was a fellow that broken down way off out in the snow and he somehow got to the road and we saw him. He was, I don't know how far he was from freezing to death. And of course we stopped and helped him because a van load of men with one guy out freezing, it looked safe. I remember leaving Hinkley one time and I wasn't five, mi five miles outside of Hinkley and I saw a fellow walking alongside the road. It was this time of year, it was in the 90s I looked at him and I thought, does he have any idea that it's 80 miles without services? He didn't even have any water with him. So I stopped and picked him up. He was kind of a rough looking guy, but I just, I, I am not, I don't like the whole thing, you know, it just, it's a stranger, but I couldn't leave him there. I, I picked him up and he was so thirsty, he was almost out of his mind. And I said, do you realize it's 80 miles to the border station, it is. And I need to go to California. And he wanted to drink so bad that I had just finished a big gulp or something, and all I had in my cup was ice, which I gave him. But I took him to the border and fed him. And it was a Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> but the Mountain Dew had fled away, it had dissipated with. But I could still remember that I weighed the situation and felt like, you know, he's, he's not going to hurt me. I'm a little afraid for him. And Joy and, I've had this, Joy and I have had this happen a couple times. We found a young man out there walking on a cold day. His car had run out of gas 
and he just started walking away from it. And I, you know, I said, I don't know, but I can't leave this guy out here. So we picked him up and got him going and gave him some money. And I, I'm always amazed at how foolish people can be. But the thing that, that I'm trying to emphasize is that your reluctance to help people is directly impacted by fatherlessness. If you were raised in a home with a father, do you know one of the most important things you had, especially if it was a good home, it was security. When a child grows up without security, they're fearful. They do become letter of the law kinds of people. They are nitpicky because they're not. And you know, Bill Johnson tells the story, he and Benny many times would take in foster children. And he said they had it happened every time. They'd bring the hot foster kids in, eat, sit down with the family, and all his kids would eat what they want and be done. The foster kids would just gorge themselves. Why? They weren't sure if there would be another meal. Your and my sense of security has everything to do with how we relate to our father through our father Abraham. Will he take care of me? Will he provide? Will there be somebody there for me? You ask yourself, when someone does something like shoot school children, every moral guardrail, every boundary line has been broken down inside this person. And, you know, it, None of us can even imagine it. But one of the things we do have to realize, you reap what you sow. The seeds you put in the ground grow the plants. Somebody, somewhere along the way, needs to face that in our country we're planting seeds that we don't like what's coming up from it. It's interesting, when you read scripture, sometimes you get this, almost a dichotomy, a separation between the people of Israel and the foreigner. And yet, if you really get into the Hebrew, and this is oversimplification, but the sojourner is treated like a native born. The person that comes in, like Ruth, and says, your God is my God, your people are my people, where you die, I'll die. And by, those people, you read uh, Ezekiel 47. Those people are considered as native born. Now the stranger who's just passing through, it's different. You're loving and kind, but you don't treat them the same way that you do. That family means something, and one of the things family means is boundaries. And this is, you know, I was reading, well, actually I was, I was listening to Dennis Prager and he was talking about fathers. And he was saying how important fathers are. And then he went on to say his father, and I don't, what's a name like Prager? It's got to be Eastern European of some kind. I don't, he's Jewish, of course. But he said his father was a very good provider, provided guardrails in the home, standards. But he said he wasn't very much of a loving person as far as outward affection and and he said, sometimes he missed that a little. He says, I'm a little more affectionate. But he says, as I look back on my life, it was so much more important to me that my dad gave our family a sense of security, put guardrails around it, made us feel cared for and provided for than the lovey-dovey stuff. Because he said, if I'm picking, I'll pick what my dad provided. Because nowadays we have a lot of people, love you, all this stuff then there's no stability. There's no guardrails. There's no sense. See, when I think about being a young child, and I'll bet most of you had the same experience, when I think of my dad and my mother, I think of total security. I think as a little child, I know if I have a problem, here's a place I can go. I can be watched out for. When that gets shattered, and it can happen in so many ways, there's something inside the heart that has to be redeemed. It's hard to function normally, and, and as good a father as most of us had, 
And I had a really good dad. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't God. And so my relationship with my earthly father has to be redeemed to, be, to know what my heavenly father is like. And I was thinking about this with uh, the letter of the law thing that comes out in Galatians. And what makes people obsess over minutia and details and miss the bigger picture? Now, I'm sure I've shared with you before because it's so frustrating to me, but the federal vet in Salt Lake. Thank heavens there was a woman that came in that is his deputy that's wonderful to work with. He, you know, when you ship semen or embryos or cattle to another country, you have to go through a list of regulations because you're trying to protect the importing country and the exporting country. And, and this is all good. But this guy, he would obsess about details. I remember one time driving through the snow to Salt Lake to get him to sign this paper. There was some little detail that actually had nothing to do with the safety of these embryos, with anything. It was just a little detail that had to be done. And, and we could have, you know, done it there. But because it wasn't done, he sent me home without the paper. I was just fuming the whole way. <laughs> because what I have found out, I don't like my will to be crossed. But, and it's so different working with this new lady that's there, the deputy. She knows what she is trying to do. She is trying to follow the rules, make sure there's no chance or small chance of disease spread, and that everybody involved, seller and buyer, are protected. She does that. This other fellow, he's more interested in did you keep the rule? That comes from insecurity. That comes from not being sure. That, that comes from, it's hard to describe, but when you read Galatians with that viewpoint, you'll see Paul is never saying that you shouldn't obey the Torah. He's saying, don't make the obedience of rules trump your relationship with people and with God. And what's more, the Jews got into a problem that Christians borrowed from them. We go to people and instead of trying to help them be everything God created them to be, we try to make them like us. And the Jews tried to do that to the people coming in. You're going to be like us. Where Paul and Peter are saying, James, bring them in, introduce them to the Messiah, let them read the Torah, the Scripture, and let that transform them. That was hard for people. In uh, Matthew 5, Yeshua gives several commands to his followers about ways they can be like their father. Do you remember any of them? One of, there's a beatitude that says, blessed are the peacemakers for what? They will be the sons of God, or called the sons of God. What does it mean to be the son of God? It means to be like him. He said this, let your light shine before men in such a way that they will see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Go back and read chapter 5. Yeshua keeps going back to, you're called to be like your Father. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's a Father. That's hard for us sometimes. He blesses the good ones and the bad ones. For if you love those who love you, what reward would you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as what? Everything goes back to the Father. And uh, 
I already mentioned the one to you that Greg mentioned today. So if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And Yeshua makes this very important statement. Maybe this is the most important thing we'll say today. He says, you're a son, not a slave or a servant. He says, the son inherits. What does that do? That gives a peace and a knowledge of security. I'm going to inherit. I'm not going to be out in the cold. Remember what Abraham said when God told him he would bless him and give him all this seed? Abraham says, what can you give me? I always think, wow, Abraham. It was actually Abram at the time. He tells God, what can you give me since I have no what? Heir. I don't have an heir. So what can you, what can you do for me? There's something inside of us, something inside of him that wanted to pass this on to his seed. That's our father. I've borrowed this from several different people, but I'm going to just share this with you. How many of you know that sometimes we exhibit the traits of slaves or orphans? When you ever act like we're going to run out of resources, that is the response of an orphan. And if you grew up in a family where there either wasn't a father or it was a struggle to survive, it, it can be very difficult. I watched the people that, a lot of them are the foundation of the house of Aaron, but many of them came through the depression. They came through those times where they didn't know if they'd be able to buy toilet paper. Probably couldn't. And they literally look at every resource like it had to be protected and cherished and held onto. And, and it got to where it was almost a vice. They were so concerned about where's the next thing coming from. This happens when you are a slave or an orphan. Traits of slaves or orphans. They can't hear the message of freedom and hope. If you go to Exodus, do you remember what happened? Moses came, brought this great message, he and Aaron. The Lord's going to deliver you. You're going to be set free. And it says they couldn't hear because of their cruel bondage. They were so buried and now Pharaoh was making to make the same number of bricks with straw. They couldn't hear. When God is saying something good to you and you can't hear it, one of the first things you have to do is say, Lord, have I allowed myself to get a slave orphan mentality? What did Yeshua say? He says, I will not leave you as what? Orphans. I'm not, I'm not going to leave you without someone to watch over you and care for you, take care of you. The expectation of the worst is another classic symptom. And I think all of us at some time or another have done this, but if you're always looking for the worst that it could be, for the pessimistic downside, it's not because you feel enabled or empowered or free. You feel bound. And it's a, it's a thing for us to petition the Holy Spirit to set us free for prayer. Because when you're in that mindset, all the provision in the world can be around you. You will not receive it. You'll look for something bad. Grumbling and complaining. That always makes all of us laugh because we know that only applies to the other people. But if you read the story of the Exodus, you'll notice the first generation that left the land never stopped complaining. The new generation that went in with Joshua, there's no record of it. It's kind of sobering. The fear of authority, no submission or compelled submission. This is a classic picture of fatherlessness. The slave, have you ever noticed that people that had a real struggle with their earthly dad very often have a problem with teachers, policemen, any kind of supervisor, the boss at work, I don't care what it is, they can't be told what to do. Something in them just rebels. That's not freedom. They've got to have the sense to know when you shouldn't do something you're asked. But most of the time we're rebelling against things for the sake of rebellion. 
not because it's good for us. I'm rebelling against that. So. The other thing that characterizes, and I think I, think I got this from, uh, at least I, Jack Frost. I knew I'd think of his name. Wouldn't you like a name like Jack Frost? But he had some excellent teaching on the slave spirit and the son spirit. And there's something in the slave or the orphan that works hard but never arrives at the inheritance, never comes to a sense of peace. Hard, it's, it's a never-ending cycle, it's drudgery. There's no sense of accomplishment. You see this, again, all through the uh, uh, story of the Exodus. The spies who went in, they took a look at the land. It was fruitful, it was watered, it was a beautiful place, it was everything God said it was, but all they could see were the obstructions. This is very much a picture of the orphan, the slave. And this, fa this final one I see is really, really important because all of us struggle with it at some level and that is that the slave or the orphan sees all their value in what they can do. They do not have a sense of value in just who I am. You see, if you grow up with mom and dad, and especially this sense of security, I'll take care of you. You value because I, you have value because you're my child. If that's your sense, even when you can't perform, and you, we all, we all need the sense of accomplishment that comes from doing things, you still know you have value. But you look at Pharaoh. To Pharaoh, the Israelites had one value work. And they couldn't work. He killed the baby boys, he, you know. The son is secure in his relationship with his father. He believes in freedom and hope and he can even come to the place of Yeshua. He's so trusting in his father that he can say, not my will but yours. Because he trusts his father. You would never say that to someone you couldn't trust. expects the best. How many of you know there's a scripture that has this statement, all things work together for good, for them that love God and are called. See, those things are just thoughts in our minds until there's this th something changed inside of us. Abraham is our father. Through him, the father brought nation of Israel, through the nation of Israel he brought the Messiah, through the Messiah he's bringing everyone into that family. Everyone has a secure place in the family if they choose. Being grateful people, praising people, thankful people. This is not a characteristic of slaves or orphans. Submitted to authority, good followers. I think it's interesting how we've seen this subtle, and now it's not even a subtle change in the view of fathers in our society. We, we even not see like, if you go way back, and my chronology is sketchy here, but shows like my three sons, father knows best, Go back and watch those shows. Leave it to Beaver. Who is the father in all those stories? He's the provider. He's the wisdom. He takes care of his wife and his children. They're the most important thing in his life, but they pro he provides security to the home. Can you find a book, a play, a movie, a sitcom that has a father in that role. Bill Cosby was very close. That's kind of a sad story, but if you go back and look at the Bill Cosby show, why was it so popular? Because again, father was funny and made mistakes, but he was there for his family. 
And, and, and you can tell how it's changed to the point, like I said, not everyone agrees with this, but you actually have articles in accepted periodicals saying the father is unnecessary. Okay, did you have your hand up? I was going to say blue bloods, but close. Yeah, blue bloods is another good one. You're right. That's true. But you know what's interesting? People like it. Why, why are those who make movies and shows and sitcoms so resistant? Because I could name you a bunch of them where the father is a bumpkin, an idiot. He's almost uh, the whole problem in the works. And, and I just point this out to say you can't have a healthy society, a healthy congregation. I don't care what kind of a group of people you have if there's no submission to authority. This doesn't mean people have to knuckle under and grovel. It just means that there's submission to authority. When you go to the center, whoever is in charge of the kitchen, you do what they ask. That's how it works when we have a son mentality versus a slave. You work hard, but you place your hope in your relationship. The son always inherits. There's a lack of competition, striving, and stress. You know, a lot of, I, I enjoy competition. There are places for competition. But if you feel like you're competing for love, this is the most unhealthy thing on the face of the earth. If you're striving to be accepted, if you're working hard to be good enough, there will be no peace in your spirit. They see the value in the relationship they have with the family, with the father. I've, I've thought about that one quite a bit. And I, I know with myself, my dad was a good picture of my heavenly father. Like I say, he wasn't perfect. He had things I'm sure he could improve. But he gave me a sense of security. And while he wasn't what I'd call a harsh person, he didn't allow me to get away with stuff. I'm sure I've told you the story before because it's so emblazoned in my mind. When I was probably seven or eight, all of us young boys were going around saying these limericks and these stories uh, that were vaguely off color. In fact, not so vague. They were just not good. My dad sat me down and said he heard I was doing some of it, and then he quoted a couple of them to me. Have you ever had a situation where you wanted to dissolve through the floor? That was one of them. I wanted to disappear because I knew that I would have never said that in front of him. Everybody here know what I'm talking about? When, you, when you're around your dad, there's no way you do it when you're away where he can't see you, then you'll do it. And then you suddenly realize, uh, one of these days, these two could come together. And your dad could know. And I can still remember, I was probably only eight or nine, the shame. And, and, and dad wasn't doing a thing to me. He just said, we don't talk like that. We don't do that. This isn't the way we behave. And I was like, oh. <laughs> And, uh, but it did something for me, and I imagine every family is a little different how this happens, but I found myself at a very early age wanting to make my dad proud of me. I wanted to behave in a way that I would bring honor to his name. I didn't always. But I realized that when this impulse is in us, it comes out of a healthy relationship that when we mess up, we know he still loves us. <laughs> we know we're still a son, we're still a daughter, but we're not gonna do that anymore. And when you look at what Yeshua, what Jesus says in John 14, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. What's the next part of the statement? statement? No man what? No one comes to the Father but through me. So what is Yeshua's job? It's to reveal the Father. When we see his kindness, his gentleness, his healing, all that, he's showing us our Heavenly Father. And I'm convinced that all of us would have so much more peace and a sense of security if we really knew who our Father was. It's interesting to me that 
When you see the father as vengeful and as Pharaoh, when you sin, your impulse is to run from him. But if you see him as your father and that this relationship is valuable and that it means everything to you, when you sin, you can't wait to come to him to fix it because you don't want this between you. The shame that comes upon us, that the thing that makes us feel terrible. You know, I've, I've had a couple of experiences with my own children where I've gone through this. And a lot of times the kids don't understand you don't hate them. You're not mad at them. You're disappointed. But they're still your kid. And you're still their father. It's time for us to close. But as we look at Genesis 12, it is the linchpin of the whole Bible that there was the fall, there was the flood, there was the Tower of Babel. There were all these judgments that scattered the people and now God sent a man, Abraham, to bring redemption and to heal the brokenness of the people. And that was through the son of David. It, it's all a story that, that comes together. Let's all stand. Brother Ron, would you close for us, please?